people, it's a new week, which means it's another echo chamber coming at you. And um, yeah, we got a yeah, it's a good episode, people. We're covering a lot of shit, but as we do, you know what I mean. Let's start off for the UK cinema box office top ten for the weekend of the fourteenth to the sixteenth of January. At number 10 is the new one from Simon Kinberg. It's The 355. All right, written by uh, Beck Smith, Kinberg, and Teresa Reddick. So Jessica Chistain, Lapita Nunguna, Diana Kruger, Penelope Cruz, Sebastian Stan. Edgar Ramirez and uh, Bing Ding Fan. Okay, we spoke about that a couple of weeks back, people. I very much enjoyed it. So, yeah. At number nine, it's the Ridley Scott piece, House of Gucci. It's so weird, something on my glasses. Yes, so this one has, an, this one also, another big cast. Salma Hayek. Adam Driver, Jared Leto, Al Pacino, Lady Gaga, Jeremy Irons, and all. At number eight, again, we spoke about this a few weeks ago. It is Encanto, the new um, new one from Disney, right? Uh, little Colombian flavor people. So this was from Jared Bush, Byron Howard, and... Uh, Carissi Castro Smith. And yeah, if you like your Disney things, people, I think you'll enjoy that one. You know what I mean? I, I liked it. I really, I you very much did. At number seven, it's the return. Right? Swallow that blue pill, or is it the red one? I forget. But it's the Matrix Resurrection from Lana Waskowski. Got Keanu Reeves, we got Carrie Ann Moss, Jessica Chistain, uh, Christina Ritchie, you know what I mean? Jada Pinkett Smith. It's a big cast, people. It's a big cast, right? So, our number six film, right? It is a West Side story from old Stevie Boy Spielberg, you know. Ansel Egert, Richard Ziegler, you know what I mean? And a, a big cast. So we are now into our top five, five, five. And at number five, people, is the new Paul Thomas Anderson film, Licorice Pizza, which I do want to see. It's a friend's birthday. So, you know what I mean? I've got to suggest a film. Might suggest that one. Yeah, <laughs> we got Alana Haim, uh, Cooper Kaufman, Sean Penn, Tom Watts, man. Oh, I've just heard good things about the flick. So at number four is Clifford the Big Red Dog. You know from Well Walt Beaker. At number three, people. It is the prequel, Matthew Vaughan goes to the beginning of the whole Kingsman legacy with the Kingsman. Gemma Atherton, Aaron Taylor-Johnson, Matthew Good, Ralph Fiennes, Daniel Brühl, Stanley Tucci, Charles Dance, Tom Hollander. What a cast, right? Damn. So at number two... We've got a, a, another revisiting to a franchise. It is the fourth, or is it the fifth? I think it might be the fifth iteration of Scream. So this is from Tyler Gillett and Matt uh, Betnor Alpin, uh, starring Neve Campbell, Courtney Cox, David Arquette. You know what I mean? The crew are back. But our number one film of the week, it is Spider-Man No Way Home. John Watts, 
does it again with the trilogy. Zeander, Tom Holland, Benedict Cumberbunch, Marissa Tomei, John Favreau, J.K. Simmons, William Dafoe. Boy. Oh, man. I can't wait to see it. Oh, you know what I mean? Ah, oh, shit. I need to get to the cinema, people. <laughs> I need money. Fuck. Okay. Well, that's our top 10. Let's get into this week's films. Buckle up, people. Let's fucking go. Okay, people. Let's get it popping with our first film, Brazen. Okay, so, man, <laughs> sometimes you make terrible decisions, right? I I decided to check out Brazen, the new Netflix film, because, right, I was looking for something a bit similar to the 2018 film, A Simple Flavor, right? Because that was a lot of, I really enjoyed that film. It, you know what I mean? It was a a thriller is a little goofy there was twists but it was enjoyable and you know what i mean like one of those little clips popped up of brazen on netflix right and i was like i mean plot wise a little goofy but let, yeah let's see it could be it could be similar so um yeah that's what i did <laughs> all right so it is directed by Monica Mitchell. Um, it is written by Edith Swenson, Donald Martin, and Su Suzette Couture, right? And it's based on a, a book by Nora Roberts called Brazen Virtue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, if I'd known that, I would have just, whoo, steer clear. But uh, yeah, it is produced by Stephanie Germain, Peter Goober, and Peter E. Strauss. Co-produced by Ariel Port and Adam Voghel. Music is James... Jan Destrich and Jeff Timushkrishk. It is edited by Christopher A. Smith. Casting is Kate Geller. Production design, Sean Kirby. And art direction, Jason Ray. So, our cast. We have got um, Kathleen a.k.a. Desiree, played by Emily Ulrup, her sister Grace, played by Alyssa Milano. We have Ed, uh, the detective, right? Um, he is played by Sam Page. He's a uh, partner. I was like, oh, what do you call it? The person you work with? Yeah, he, his partner in the force is Ben, played by Malachi Weir. Right? Um, their boss, Captain Riviera, is played by Alison Araya. Um, the, the janitor at the school where Kathleen works, Billy, is played by Aaron Paul Stewart. Uh, his mum is played by Nikki Bryce. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Who the fuck else is um, oh, mentioning? Uh, we have Senator Baxter played by Colleen uh, Wheeler. Um, Her son, Gerald, is played by Matthew Finland. Um, 
we have Rand Morgan, played by Daniel Dima. He goes to school with Gerald. His dad, Paul Morgan, is played by Barry W. Levy. Uh, we have Stacy White, played by Lucen Chambers. Uh, Lisa Clark, played by April Tellick. Richie, played by Jack Armstrong. Lawrence, played by Matt Bula. Mm, I, yeah, I, I would say that's probably it. Right, they're the, they're the main peoples. And the gist of the story is this. After a demanding book tour, superstar mystery novelist Grace McCabe decides to visit her sister Kathleen, who's embroiled in a custody battle after a bitter divorce. Arriving in D.C., Grace is shocked to find Kathleen living in a rundown neighborhood and hoping to afford a hotshot lawyer supplementing her meager teacher's salary by moonlighting as a phone sex superstar. Right? I mean, say a meager. Like, teachers aren't horribly played. <laughs> like, you could say, oh, you know what I mean? Uh, do they deserve more? Who the fuck knows? But I think mean, to say meager is a little... Anyway, that's by the by. Anyway, getting back, right? Uh, according to Kathleen, Fantasy Inc. guarantees its employees ironclad anonymity, but Grace has her doubts, which are confirmed one horrifying cherry blossom scented night when one of Fantasy Inc.'s operators is murdered. As Grace is drawn to help solve the crime, her life turns into a scene from one of her own books. Yet, as one of her biggest fans, investigator Ed Jackson, warns her, this isn't fiction. <laughs> Real people die, and Grace could be next. For she's setting a trap for a killer more twisted than anything she could imagine. <laughs> and not even Ed may be able to protect her from a rendezvous with Lost and Dare. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. I mean, that synopsis is... Boy, that, that's online with this goddamn movie plot <laughs> because oh man I didn't enjoy this I didn't enjoy it I mean what can I say right I mean it was a nothing like a simple flavor <laughs> I, I will I will tell you that from the giddy up right I mean <sighs> the big things for me firstly the writing is horrendous the writing is very bad. Oh my gosh, it is just it, it, it's not good writing. The story makes no sense, right? Story makes no sense, right? There's a scene where Grace turns up at the police station, and um, you know she wants she wants Ed to give her information, and the police. Chief Riviera calls them into the office and she's just like, Grace, I love all your books. I read every single one from, you know, front to back, which always a weird thing when people say, because, you know, that's how you read a fucking book. Yes, I know. I mean, in China, Japan, one of those, the books are the other way around, but you're reading it from the first page to the last page. Right, that's how you finish a book, unless you'd be like, I couldn't finish that book. Right? It's the same from front to back. It's a stupid, it's a stupid expression. Anyway, tangent. That's what so she says this, but then she's like, But I don't think you can help with this case. Right? I've looked into you. I know everything about you, but I don't think you could help with the case. Grace is just like, oh, I helped with the NYPD. I helped them solve the case. And she's like, you know what? You're on the case. It's just like, wait, what? 
<laughs> you said you looked into her. You read all her books, all of this, but you don't want it. She says one thing and then you're like, oh, you're on the case. <laughs> it was stupid, right? It just made no sense. Because it, you, you could be like, oh, you know what I mean? I like your books, but I don't think you could help. And she's like, oh, but I helped you. And like, huh, I didn't know that. He'd be like, okay, come on board. Right? But it's just like, you know, she's a writer. And it's just like, you're one of the best profilers in the game. He's just like, being a profiler and a novelist are two different things. Right? Two fucking different things. But that is, you know, he just part... at the very beginning, when we first meet Ed, he goes into a store to buy coffee, right? And then we get a uh, a, a stick-up, right? Stick-up. He, you know, tackles the guy. This is at the very bit. It's not a spoiler, people. He tackles the guy, right? His partner walks into the, ro- into the you know, shop. And he's just like, hey. Sees him on the ground tackling this guy, like tussling with him. He's like, hey, where's my coffee? He also, did he pay for the car? He's just like, what What the fuck is... Come on! It was just stupid. It was dumb. Right? You Now, you could have that if you really want that shitty dialogue. You could have it. But at least have him like, hey, take my cups. I've, I've got my gun on him. Cover him up. And be like, man, you're always getting in trouble. Have you at least got my coffee? You mean something that makes more sense. But just to be like, it was stupid. It was stupid. And he basically set the tone for everything that we see. Right? There there was a scene where, um, you know, they're trying to track down the killer. And they, they go to arrest someone. And they're like, hey, what about this? And, you know, someone's like, hey, everyone in this thing has that thing, right? Which is key. And you'd think, right, that then narrows down a line of interrogation. They don't do it. They don't follow. You're just like, wait, this information is given, which then gives you a a clear lane into who may do it, who may have done these things, but you're not following that up, right? It was, I, I, and essentially, you know who did it from the giddy. Like, there's a thing that the, the acting and just the dialogue is so bad, it's transparent who does it, who's, you know, who's behind everything. That's the thing. Right, the at the start when we have Grace meet Ed, right? So he's working outside chopping wood, and she's just like she she looks out the window. And she's like, "Hey, you with the chainsaw," and he's just like, "I've got one more bit to cut," and then she's like, "Okay," and you're like, "What?" <laughs> like if you go firstly, you could shut the window. Right, that 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 could be the first thing. Like, it's not like you know. I mean, she she opened the window to shout out with intention. There was nothing there, so it's this pointless thing. Then you have her go, oh, I'm gonna make him coffee and go talk to him. And it's just like bringing him coffee is weird because it's like. Oh, I'm assuming that you don't have coffee, right? It's like you're you're working outside a house, which you don't know he doesn't own, right? And even if he doesn't own the house, he's just a workman. The owners of the house will be providing him with shit. So bringing coffee was a, a weird, it's a weird fucking thing. And the, the fact being, you don't know how someone takes a coffee. Some people have milk, some people have black, some people have honey, some people have sugar, like flavoring, syrups, there's all, some people don't drink coffee, some people are strictly key, some people don't do caffeine, like it's a weird thing, and then when she's like, oh, I googled you, 
And he's just like, what? And the fact he, oh, he comes up straight. It was just horrible. The interactions were horrible. And I just, there was no sense of connection, right? You didn't feel, oh, these two people are falling in love. Or even Kathleen and Grace, right? That interaction, you wouldn't go look at it and go, oh, man, they, yeah, these feel like sisters, right? It just was very forced to be like, oh, what are you doing? I didn't expect you here so soon. <laughs> it was just, ugh, so robotic. They're always wearing makeup. So you have a scene when they're in, in like, it's late. Supposedly one, one's crying. Still perfect makeup, right? No no streaks or anything like that. Then they get into bed and be like, okay, I'm going to sleep with you tonight. Ah, oh, falling asleep. All in like these full robes. And it's like, no one's sleeping like that. What the fuck are we doing here? Come on, man. Right? What are we doing? Like the, the scenes, the interactions, it doesn't, nothing felt real. Right, Riviera was a like everyone's a cliche. Riviera was a straight cliche. It was just like, I'm a woman in charge. Oh, you have to call me, you know, boss. Like you have the the the, the officer leave. And he's like, okay, ma'am, I'll do that. And she's like, huh? she's like, sorry, Captain, ma'am. And it's just like, who like? If he left the room being rude, you could understand. And you're assuming they work together for a long time here, right? So no one's doing these weird corrections, right? It's the, the way she's doing it, like running it. It was just, you know, just this weird, weird dynamic, right? Listen, we've seen women as bosses, CEOs, all of is it's not like, whoa, a woman police chief? That's crazy. I mean, look, there was a woman chief in fucking Dexter, in Castle, you know what I mean? In so many of these police shows, right? You're not breaking down boundaries. Hey, right? so you don't have to kind of write in this weird way. Ugh. I yeah, I'm just I just I mean, this wasn't for me, right? This was for your Mills and Boo audience, right? For people that consume, you know, the, that that literature where you've got a, a shirtless dude on the front cover chopping wood, right? Or or taking off his, you know, you know, shitty, or it just you've just got the shot of the abs. So just it, it was for motherfuckers that read those books, right? You know what? Hey, you might not like the stuff I read, so it's fine, whatever. If you like Fifty Shades, all of that, if you like, as I said, Mills and Boom, I think Brazen is probably your thing. It it just wasn't mine. <laughs> you, hey, hey, another thing they do, right? So, firstly... The, the, this whole setup with the sister, Kathleen, right? She's like, I think my ex-husband is going to try and stop me getting custody of my son, saying I'm a bad mother. And he's like, yeah, but you said you were a pill addict, right? So you probably were, right? But the here's the thing. You know, we all go through periods of time when something might be shitty. It, no, so, hey, during this period of time when you were a dirty addict, yeah, you were probably a shitty mother. But it doesn't mean you're always going to be a shitty mother, right? So if you just had the story like, oh, I wasn't an addict, I've cleaned up my act, and now I want to show that I can be the mother that the kid deserves, boom, fine. That's fine. But, yeah, this weird narrative they're trying to play, but they have, oh, I cleaned up my act, and now I'm a teacher? Right? There, there's these weird things. And we have seen people can't get jobs after certain info gets out. So it's just like, oh, so she's just going to be a teacher, right? 
she wasn't a teacher before, but now she all of a sudden she's a teacher. And the best teacher there, the the one teacher the kids can like, you're just like, oh my gosh. And then when you know, in her other boss is talking, she's like, hey, you know, desire was the best we had. Everyone, and you're just like, oh. Do we have to always write people as, oh, they're the best teacher, they're the best exotic dancer, they're the best at this. It's so cliche and lazy. It's lazy. It's like you can't write nuance. You know what I mean? Anyway, people, yeah, this wasn't for me. It wasn't for me. It might be for you. So, brazen. It's based on brazen virtue. Horrible book title. Horrible book title. But, yo, it's on Netflix, people. You might enjoy it. So there you go. All right, people. It's the first of our Shudder exclusives. Get ready for the last thing Mary saw. <laughs> Okay, so we have a new Shudder horror film dropping this week, people. And it is called The Last Thing Mary Saw. The, the, the title just reminds me of Jimi Hendrix. That's, that's all I think of when I hear that title. You know what I mean? Um, it's actually the feature directorial debut from... Edardo Vitaletti, who wrote um, and directed this feature. You know, it is produced by Harrison Allen, uh, Isson Robbins, Amy Schmoff, Madeline Schumacher, and Stephen Tedeschi. With Scoop Wasterstein, Karen Redstone, Mike Nichols, and Joseph Michael Alagna, executive producing. Keegan DeWitt handles the music. David Kruter is on cinematography. Matthew C. Hart handles the editing. Um, Kate Geller is casting. Production design was Charlie Chaspuli Robinson and Tiffany Stoker on art direction. Our cast, well, Mary, you know, as she's in the title, she is played by Stephanie Scott. Uh, we've then got Eleanor, the maid, played by Isabel Foreman. Um, the matriarch of the family is played by Judith Roberts. Uh, then we've got Agnes, who's played by Caroline McCormick. Um, Eustace the head of the family, Tommy Buck. He plays him. Eustace's son is played by Shane Kofi. Um, we have Randolph, who is played by Michael Lawrence. Um, Anne, who is played by Dawn McGee. Theodore, the uh, guard of the house, grounds. He's played by P.J. Sosko. Um, we have the interrogator, played by Daniel Pierce. Oh, their son, Matthew, is played by Elijah Raymond. Um, the grandfather is played by Stephen Lee Anderson. So deputy number one is played by Philip Hoffman. Deputy number two 
is played by Matthew Stanner. Uh, Deputy number three is played by Sebastian Beacon. Uh, we then have the interrogator played by Daniel Pierce. And our intruder is played by Rory Culkin. So, yes. Now, the gist of the story is this. Okay. South Hold, New York, 1943. Young Mary, blood trickling from behind the blindfold tied around her eyes, is interrogated about the events surrounding her grandmother's death. As the story jumps back in time, we witness Mary raised in a repressively religious household, finding fleeting happiness in the arms of Eleanor, the home's maid. Her family, who believe they are seeing, speaking and acting on God's behalf, view the girl's relationship as an abomination to be dealt with as severely as possible. The couple attempt to carry on in secret, but someone is always watching or listening. And the wages of perceived sin threaten to become death. With the tension only heightened by the arrival of an enigmatic, egg, enigmatic stranger, I don't really say that, but hey-ho. Um, and the revelation of greater forces at work. So, yes, that is the film, people. And, yeah, it's, it is interesting, right? I think because we get these time jumps and everything like that. Now, you know, it, like, it starts in an okay way, right? We see Mary um, holding a book and, and there. And yeah, she's getting asked questions, right? And that's when we kind of jump back in time. Now, the one thing is we see the blood kind of coming down her face here. Now, later in the story... It seems that there is a day gap, which then does make me ask the question. I don't believe there'd be blood running down the face after a day. <laughs> you know, I'm no doctor, but I don't think it's going to be bleeding, you know what I mean, for over 24 hours. That seems a little crazy. But, yeah, we, we jump back. And, yeah, it, it's like... Mary and Eleanor, they like each other, right? But as I said, it's a, it's a deeply religious household or a crazy house. Um, and they see it's a sin. Ah. Now, I will say, the, these girls, I, they get, we, we see them get in trouble the first time, right? And they don't really do a great job of sneaking. Their sneaking is just mad flawed. You're like, yo, if this shit is going down, if you're getting punished, or they call it corrections, you know what I mean, for being caught, y'all be keeping your shit mad fleeting, right? So a little kiss, you know what I mean? Maybe do a little ting ting. Right, but then you're not lying in each other's arms, be like, read me a story. Like you you'd be they're not discreet. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, hey, I feel bad. I feel bad for the shit they went through, but I'm like, yo, you gotta do better, man. You can't be taking that much time. Come on, you know, it's a little crazy. It is a little crazy. But 
But um, there, there were kind of scenes, because it is a very dark film in, in the way it's lit. Right, and certain places darker than others. So I think there was certain things that I don't think were necessarily overly clear. Like we, we see the girls kneeling and it looks like they're in pain. And it's just like, uh, why are they in pain? Like what? And when Elena, no, Mary gets up, we see her knees. And it looks like we say, all right, what, what's happening here? I don't know. And it's not until a bit later in the film that we then kind of learn. It's not so much learn what they nail on, but it's alluded to with a statement about something else. So you think, oh, it must have been that. Okay, right, got it. But it, it's not clear. You know, and I think that's there are elements of the film that aren't necessarily clear. You know, because as the film right in the synopsis where it says, oh, and we learn a greater force is involved. Right. Again, I don't necessarily think that is overly clear. Right? There, there's things that happen that you then go, okay, but if that's a thing, then why is this person not shocked? Like, where is that? Because if it is, you know, supernatural, uh, however you want to say it, you'd think there would be a level of, yeah, shock or, you know, fear. But that's not necessarily evident, right? I, I will say there is definitely tension here, right? There's definitely tension in the story. I, I could have done without the mood music, ain't going to lie. But, yeah, the, you know, fear and, and that kind of thing, not so much. I think... Um, like, although I think you look at the things that happen to Eleanor and Mary and you feel bad for them, you don't necessarily feel that attachment to the characters, right? No one really has a lot of depth, so it's all surface level you know, the emotions that you have for these people, which is a shame, right? Because you think, ah, if, if there was more, if, 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 you know what I mean, I was pulled into these moments a little bit more, I think it would hit home harder, but I didn't necessarily feel that, you know? Not to say the act, the acting is solid. The acting is definitely solid. I think you, you feel a lot of the emotion that is there between Mary and Eleanor. You feel that. You know, some of the shock and stuff like that, but that, nothing else, you know? Don't really feel that other stuff. You know, like the whole intruder thing it, it doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense, right? Especially when you tie in stuff with Theodore, right? Because you kind of then question some later on things, and you're like, but why? You know? So all of that. But I think one big thing that does become a little bit like, hmm, is at the very end, right? That the interrogation that we see more of, you're really like, all right, but we so, we see what happens, which you kind of feel there would be a lot of questions, right? And 
it, it, it's hard to then hold on one per like with everything you'd be like uh but there was gunshots like what about that right what about bum 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 you know what I mean there's all this other stuff that you're kind of like what about like who answers for that stuff you know what I mean what was all of that right so I don't know. It, it's an in. It's interesting, and it's not a bad directorial debut. You know, because I mean? there's definitely a lot of promise here, definitely for sure. But it's not like th th there's elements of this film that kind of reminded me of um, the power. Right, another shutter piece, which is you know the one set in the hospital, right? Um, just for the feel, like, and some of the tone of the film, right, and all of that. But Power had a more, I mean, complete story that made sense in the telling, but with um, the last thing Mary saw, it did seem that there are gaps you know what i mean there, there are things here that maybe they were lost on the editing floor or maybe it just wasn't there in the story in the first place but there are these things that you're like okay but what about this and this all right and how do we get from that to that and why would that person do this thing right after they did that and that and that so yeah that that was the only thing with this story for me but I will say, you know what I mean? It's not terrible, right? It's definitely not terrible. And as I said, for a directorial debut, it's not bad at all. There is a lot of promise here. So I'm interested to see what Eduardo does next. But with this, I wouldn't say it's the strongest thing on Shudder. But again, it's not the worst thing on Shudder. You know, if you like your period pieces, then I think, you know, this, you, you, yeah, you, you will, I'd say you probably will enjoy it, you know. I would, um, oh, yeah, if we're looking at, you know, Shudder titles, then as I said, look, um, the power is definitely something that, it kind of stands by. Um, I would also... Hmm. I would also kind of think, right, if you like stuff like... Like, Sun is another kind of tonally similar piece. Um... But it, it's not as strong as those films, you know. Like, um, I think it's it's a little similar to the strings. You know what I mean? So I think if you enjoy those films, right, or the reckoning, um, though I do think it's probably a little stronger than the reckoning. So I think if you liked the reckoning then this does balance out, right? I, I, I think, yeah, I think they're good reference points, people. But as I said, look, it's dropping on Shudder this week, today even. So, um, yeah, there you go, people. The last thing Mary saw. Okay, so we are sticking with Shudder for this interesting one it is the runner okay so man i i found this um new show on shudder it's called the runner and it is very interesting right it's just 39 minutes right 39 minutes and it is from a band called Boy Harsha, and then Boy Harsha is made up of two people, Jay Matthews 
and Augustus Muller. So Jay, she's the vocalist, and Augustus, he um, he handles the boards, as it were, right? Um, so yeah, they write, direct, and produce the piece, along with um, Daniel April, uh, Dan Fek, Fefk, uh, Tenya Kelleher. Uh, they also produced the film along with um, Matthews and Muller. Um, yeah, obviously, right? Matthews and Muller, their band does the music. The cinematography is from Daniel Debre. Um, it's edited by Matthews and Muller. Um, Matthews handled the casting. Uh, production design is Luke Carr and Chaz Foggy. Makeup was Jared Baluk. Uh, sound was Killian Brum. Special effects, Jared Baluk. Um, and they were also helped out by Maziro Bagu. Um, Jordan Romaro, Mattia Simvich. So yeah, that, that that's that. And the gist is this, right? A strange woman travels to a secluded rural town where her violent compulsions are slowly revealed. So it's all very, it's all very intriguing. And we open up, right? In, in in this room, it's a dark room, and there's a TV playing, and a TV has a woman singing, right? Jay Matthews, the band, Boy Harsha, they're performing, right? And so we're, 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 the camera's slowly moving through the room, and we don't really see what's in the room, but if you pay attention, there's reflections in the window, which shows you someone in a seat. Right, so the music's playing, and we have the band. Then we we have a a woman running, right? A woman running through the uh, through a forest. Oh, yeah! I just realised. Um, I did not let you know who's actually um. In the piece. <laughs> so the woman running is Chris Isfandari. Uh, we also have Sigrid Lauren and Cooper B. Handy. Uh, yeah, they're our main kind of people in the uh, in the story. And so, yeah, we, we kind of see this woman running. Right. And. She kind of does the platoon thing, like drop to the knees and be like, ah, which then fits into the song because we don't actually, yeah, we don't see this woman talk, right? But it's the visuals that really bring it to life that you can kind of guess what's being said, what's being thought through the music and then just the scenes, right? Because we, we see her go to a house where um, Cooper B is, right? He runs off as soon as he sees her. But she, may, she, you know, when she enters, and you're wondering, what the fuck? But you kind of figure, I think he must know her, right? And then she is going through the house, and she she uncovers something. And you think, oh, okay, right? And you know what I mean? There's these few things that she finds, and I think it tells a bit of a story, right? And, and although we don't know what the fuck happened to this woman, right? You kind of think, all right, I'd be a little bit pissed if what these things are are what you might think these things are. You feel me, right? So... Yeah, you, we see a hitchhiking, gets in a car. 
But there, there, there's things we don't see, but then you presume that's what's going down, right? But yeah, she, she, you know, she goes to a town, um, goes into a bar, right? And all of this is narrated to us essentially from the music from the band, right? And what's fun is. So when we see them on TV, that's not just a random thing, because while we're seeing these other things take place, right, we then go to back to the TV. And it's essentially a public access channel, right? So you have a, a woman kind of presenting, and she's like, hey, now we're seeing the band in studio. So we see Boy Harsha performing, right, some of the songs, but then we kind of get little behind the scenes, you know, of the, the, you know, the dance routines, and we also get these little bits of interviews with Muller talking about, you know, how he kind of got into things, and then Matthews on just what she envisions the woman is, Right, so we kind of get those takeaways, which are very intriguing, amongst all this other stuff. Right, the woman presenting it gives you that kind of eighties, you know what I mean, late night TV feel, you know. Um, but yeah, we got all these visuals happening, and it is it's intriguing, man. And so much is getting said with no <laughs> dialogue. Right, which is always just, it's a difficult thing to do. Not everyone can do this, but I feel they do it very well, right? Now, we don't, we don't really get answers to everything that went down, you know, what might be causing this woman's actions other than this discovery at the start, but I, it doesn't really matter, you know what I mean, because like the, the, this little, because it's what, 38, 39 minutes, so it's not crazy long, but it, it's long enough to kind of suck you in, suck you in, and just, man, just create this visual kind of experience, which is it's very enjoyable, and I will say, like, this is the first time I've come across Boy Harsha, but just from this, I would be interested to listen to more of their stuff, you know what I mean, so, obviously, I'm going on iTunes after this, I'm going to listen through my Apple Music, you feel me, but also, the direct, it, it's very well done, so, you know what I mean? You'd be like, I, I'd like more stuff like this. You know what I mean? I'd like, yeah, I'd be down to see more stories, more visual sonic stories from Boy Harsha. So it is out now on Shudder. It's called The Runner. And it's different, people. But different is not a bad thing. It is very very enjoyable. So if you like kind of experimental stuff, kind of feel that the runner is going to be. Okay, people. So we are ending with uh, this new indie flick, a first time one, and it's pretty good. It's pretty great. It is home. Okay, so I was very intrigued by this new film, right? It is called Home. So it's a little bit of a generic title, right? And you see the poster, and it's just, you know, a dude in a tracksuit. He looks like one of the um one of the bros from Hawkeye, right? He's in a tracksuit smoking a cigarette. It's very nondescript. Right, there's there's not a lot that you can really gauge from this. 
You know what I mean? Like sometimes you look at a post and you'd be like, oh, that's intriguing. Or, oh, it looks like it's going to be a thriller or a horror. You know what I mean? This one, no. As I said, look, you, th there's not a lot you can take from it. But when you look at the cast, right, you look at the director, it's definitely intriguing, you know? So this is a written and directed by Franca Potent. I feel that's how you say it. P-O-T-E-N-T-E. -E. Yeah, let's say Franca Potent. You, um, listen, she's been in a lot of films, Run Lola Run. She's the, you know what I mean? She's Marie, right? The love interest in the uh, Born Identity. Um, and then... Uh, is this Born Supremacy? I feel Born Supremacy was then the next one, right? Where, um, you know, eh, it doesn't go too well for her, but she's in those films, right? So this is her um, feature directorial debut. And she's, like, when you look, she's directed another, a, a short film, Digging for Belladonna, but that was in 2006, Right. She wrote that one as well. So when you a lot of the time, you know, what I mean, people have produced a lot of short films before the feature. So the fact that one short, right, one short 15 years ago and now she does this, that's intriguing. You know what I mean? Uh, so it is produced by ja Jonas Katzenstein, Maximilian Leo, um, co-produced by Leontine Petit, uh, Christian Gumpfer, David Grumbach, and, well, Chevy Chen and Eric Gingis, with Utra Amil Fink, uh, John Michaels, Andrew Sugarman, and Harris Tolchin, executive producing. The music is from Volker Bertelman and Raphael Seyfried. Cinematography is Frank Gribby. It's edited by Antij Zinaga. Casting was uh, Nancy Foy. Uh, production design, Cora Pratt's. Now, our cast. Well, we have um, the great Kathy Bates. She plays Bernadette, and that is the mother to Marvin, played by Jake McLaughlin. Um, then there is Aislin. Francisci, who plays Delta, right? Her um, her cousin Russell is played by James Jordan. Uh, we've got um, Jaden, who is played by Lil Ray Howry, which was definitely an interesting one, right? Stephen Root. Plays Father Browning. Uh, we have Samantha Clay plays Kaylin. Um, Brian Vale plays Katie. That's uh, Delta's friend. Um, we've got Rich Hutchman as Ron. Chelsea Gonzalez as Mindy. Uh, CJ Hoff as Ricky Flintow, um, James Croak as Caleb Flintow, and Kale Clausen as Aiden Flintow. They're Russen, Ru Ru Russell's cousins. There's Wade, who's played by Derek Richardson, and that is um, a friend of Marvin's. And there's a doctor who's played by Paul Cassell. Um, they're kind of our main 
group Nancy played by Gwen Van Dam, uh, Nurse Sarah played by Algerita Wynn, uh, Noreen played by Carolyn Luna. Yeah, that 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 that's our our main group, I would say. All right, and the gist of the film is this: an ex felon returns home from prison and must confront the demons of his past. So, yeah, it's you know what I mean. There's not even a lot in that, and this film, it's not it's not action packed. Right, it's um, it's a little slice of life uh, feature here, you know, and man, it it starts like it starts off, and we've got Marvin on his skateboard, right, skating down, you know, a dusty road. So you're just like, hmm, okay, all right, where's it going? And I'd say from the giddy up, I, I was drawn in because we have this, com like he drives past a diner, he goes in, and then we see him smoking outside with, um, I, I think, believe it is Kalen, right? He, he, we see him smoking outside. And just that interaction, oh man, that interaction was just like, it wasn't a crazy one, right? Because you know, they're smoking, and then she's just like, do you want to make out? I mean, we could fuck if there's time. And then he, Marvin's just like, oh, no, nah, I've got to go. And then he's just like, oh, not, not for any other reason. i just got to get home. Like, you're, you're pretty enough, but it's just, I've got to... And it was just this awkward interaction, and you just saw the... Like, it, it wasn't, like, dejection on Kaylin's face, but there's just this kind of acceptance of the situation. Like, neither of them are, like, happy. It's just this thing, and it, but it just felt very natural and real, right? Awkward. And that, I think that speaks a lot, right? Capturing a moment like that, it's not necessarily the easiest thing to do. There's a many films that we watch and like these big moments are handled really well, but the, 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 the minutiae of life, right? The, these inner footstep moments, those sometimes feel real clunky. So when, when you see that that is handled in a particular way, it, it gives you confidence in the film, in the script, right? In everything that you're, you're going to be seeing. And it, it, it lets you believe, right? Because this is the thing. You want to be able to believe in the moments, in everything that's going down. So we, we then see him speaking with, um, you know, Father Browning, right? A another kind of a weird, awkward situation. But again, it just felt natural. And so the gist is, you know, he went to prison for killing someone, right? A grandmother to Russell and Delta. And he's been in jail 17 years. You know what I mean? He, he's nearly 40, so he went in, like, probably 18, 19, maybe 20. You know what I mean? He, he spent most, about half his life so far in jail, essentially. And so we have, like, these other moments where he's talking about stuff, but he, you know what I mean? He's out of the loop. He doesn't know things have changed. Right, there was this this moment where, um, yeah, a, a picture is taken on a phone, and they're like, oh, "Man, that was so quick! Look at that!" Or he's talking with Wade, and it's just like, "Hey, Wade, 
oh, remember that band? Do you still have their CD? It's just like, yo, we don't do CDs now, right? It's this. And so it's these little moments, right, that build into the film, you know, and it doesn't take these easy routes through this story, Like there's a confrontation and a point you think, ah, okay, we're going to, he's been in jail. We're going to have him like fuck everyone. But no, that doesn't go down. It doesn't go down like that. So all these interactions, you'd be like, yeah, no, I believe, you know, I believe this, right? Just the, the weird situation at the start of the petrol station, you know, like, like that kind of it, it lets you know the um you know the way the community is feeling about Marvin's return you know Kathy Bates was fantastic like everyone really did a great job here you know what I mean like these performances you just as I said look they just felt so real like, this was so believable. So believable. And it has to be, right? These performances have to be tight. Because the way the story goes, right? Looking at these interactions, these relationships, you wouldn't buy it otherwise. You know? Now, it, it kind of... Now, <laughs> when I say this, right, it reminded me a little of Monster's Ball. And not because it's a similar story or anything like that, but it was just the this situation that you just think on paper, it's like, fuck, how could this happen? But with the way the story unfolds and the way we see everything, you can definitely see how it happened, this is very believable, but unlike, you know, because the thing, um, with Monster's Ball, I didn't really buy it, there didn't seem enough time to establish this change of mind, but with this, right, we see it from the start, like little conversations between Delta and Russell, you know, and she's just like, I was a little kid, I don't really remember you know, so we see all of these different things. And so as the story goes, you'll be like, okay, yeah, no, I can I can see that. Even decisions that get made and then maybe the regret of making those decisions, all of that is here. All of that is here. And as I said, uh, you know, potent for a first time feature, she just handles this material with such deft. You know what I mean? Like, it's not too heavy, right? It's not too heavy, and it's not too light. You know what I mean? Like, we get a little dark with some conversations, right? We get the hatred and the, you know what I mean, just the resentment here. It is all there. But also, like, we don't necessarily get the full story on situations, right? We don't go into, well, it happened because of this. And this, and this. Now, we do feel that there is more to it than, you know, we necessarily hear. But that doesn't matter. We don't need the detail because everything, all the all the breadcrumbs, all the fragments, it's enough to relay these emotions to us, right? It's enough to set the stage for what we are watching here. You know, it, it, it's, it's a very good film, right? It, it, it really, really is. You know, it also kind of reminded me of the, uh, I think it was a Sarah, I, I believe it's Sarah Polly. I want to say Sarah Polly, right? She she made a film, 
Um, which, oh God, I, you know, I'm trying to remember what the freak the film was called, but My Life Without Me, that's it, which is just this heartfelt, just really oh, raw film. And again, not a whole lot. It's not action packed, not a whole lot actually happens, but we're, you know, following the interactions of these characters and over this really sad thing that's about to go down. And that's like home, right? That that's what home is. It's this snapshot into these people's lives at this really raw moment. Right, where the past is intersecting with the current future. No, the current present day. <laughs> it couldn't be the current future because that makes no sense, right? But it's this intersection which leads into what is next. And they don't make any grand, you know what I mean, statements or put people on a certain path or anything. There's things that are, are said, there are things that are hinted, but that's it. And you just think, yeah, no, I, I, I'm glad they went that way. I'm glad it didn't end in this certain way or we didn't see these characters do certain things, you know? Everything is, is, is very believable. It's very raw and it is a very good film, people. It really is. I Listen, I definitely recommend it, right? I definitely recommend it. Um, yeah, it, it, it's funny because sometimes you read the statements from the distribution people and you just be like, <laughs> of course you're going to say that. But, right? Um, you know, light bulb uh, distribution, right? Their uh, acquisition managers, director even said, Home is the gripping debut feature from Frankie Potente. We were blown away by it. Kathy Burke shines as she always does. And Jake McLaughlin gives a flawless performance as an ex-con seeking a second chance. And I gotta say, yeah. I'd be like, it's one of those times where I read that and I'd be like, no, you've nailed it, right? That, that's exactly it. So, people, it is out on Monday, the 24th of January. You can get it from Amazon, Apple, Sky, Virgin, Google, just all them places you pick up your VODs, you know what I mean? So, hey, as I said, look, if you like, um, I mean, they, they did, they say, um, Hill Boy eulogy, right? Which, you know, that's all right. But I would say if you liked My Life Without Me and stuff like that, then, you know, I, I definitely feel that home is going to be a film for you. Okay. So flawless performances, you know, a, a raw story, people, what more do you want? Okay. 24th of January, go get you some home. <laughs> Okay, people, so we draw to a close on another episode, but before we bounce, let's take a look and see what's happening in the world of film. You know how we do, people. Well, it would seem that we are getting a new biopic, right? Um, and it is from uh, those funny or die crew, right? And it's about Weird Al Yokovic. <laughs> yeah, they're calling it Weird, the Al Yokovic story. Um, 
So they, they, they're going right into it all. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah. What is it? We've got the weird... Um, here's it. The synopsis. Torrid celebrity love affairs and famously depraved lifestyle. And how he went from gifted child prodigy to the greatest musical legend of all time. <laughs> So, um, hey, that, that's amusing, right? So, Jokovic and Eric Appel wrote the film. So, um, you have that. And playing the weird one is Daniel Radcliffe. So, I mean, that's interesting. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know if he's got the chops for it. I don't know if he can sing. You know what I mean? But, um, yeah, that's what's happening, people. That is what is happening. So it's, um, yeah, it's an a, a Ruku. Is that, I feel that's how you say it. A Ruku channel exclusive. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah. There you go. <laughs> um, now, another thing. So, man, I think it was two, maybe three years ago, right? Netflix had that series, Woo Assassins, right? Um, and, how? like, I thought it was done. You know, maybe they were going to do a second season. What I wasn't expecting, they're doing a film, Right? A, a film to tie it all off, uh, which will be dropping on the 17th of February. It's called Wu Assassin's Fist Full of Vengeance. And um, what they're saying is it begins after the events of the first season as restaurant owner Jenny Wa gets mysteriously killed. That prompts Kai Jin and his team to band together one more time to find a killer. Their mission sees them having to meet the Queen of Bangkok underworld in broad daylight. Bah, bah, bah. So, yeah, if you enjoyed the series, you have that to look forward to. Something else that was a, a bit surprising... Right, so um, you know, Ron Howard and Brian Grazer have their Imagine Entertainment, which has turned out countless of you know beloved TV series and films. But what that what's happening is they are selling right a majority stake in the organization to an investment company in London. Right, which yeah, interesting. Right, because I kind of figured if anyone was going to buy something like that, it would be, you know, another studio or a streamer. But no, it's an investment company. You know, they're selling um seventy percent. Right now, what they're saying is that um you know Howard and Grazer would stay on as shareholders. But I wonder how that might change operations. Who knows? Who the fuck knows, right? Um, now, Mark Foster has got his next film lined up, right? It is a remake of A Man Called Ove, which was a huge hit in Sweden in 2015. You know, it was an adaptation of the... Friedrich Buckman novel of the same name and it was actually the biggest selling foreign film in the US uh, you know the next year so um, yeah Foster is directing and Tom Hank Tom Hank Tom Hanks is going to be starring as Oove the old gentleman um He'll, he'll also be producing the film, you know? So, um, yes. Uh, Dave McGee is writing the script, 
right? Um, with Gary Gutzman, Frederick Wilkstrom, Nikis Castro, and Rita Wilson also coming on board to produce. Uh, so Ridley Scott, we know he's got his Napoleon Bonaparte biopic coming. And um, it was going to be called Kit Bag, but it looks like they have changed the title to just Napoleon. Which, you know, I think I can kind of understand why, right? Because although Kit Bag is a, is a, is a good title, man, it's interesting. But I think a lot of people would be like, what the fuck is that? Whereas Napoleon, you know what I mean? People know what the fuck you're getting. You know what I mean? So it's a shame, but I understand. Um, it's an interesting one, right? So Tyler Perry, he's been in countless of big films. But he's also produced his own films. And one being his Medusa, Medu Medea franchise, which we haven't really gotten in the UK until now because there's a new entry coming right and it's coming pretty soon the 25th of february we'll see a medea homecoming and it's coming on netflix so yeah everyone will be able to see it you know no matter what country you are in um now perry again writes and directs right it's the 12th in the line of these films, right? And they're saying that um, it centers around um, Medea's great grandson's college graduation as hidden secrets and family drama threaten to destroy a happy reunion. Bah, bah, bah. So if you've enjoyed the previous outings, people, February 25th, you get another dose. So, man, Agatha Christie, right, uh, has wrote so many books. Hercule Poirot and uh, Miss Marple being probably her, her best loved creations. But she did write a few um, standalone ones, right? She did write some a few different pieces. One being is um, Endless Night, right? And Studio Chanel and the picture company are bringing that to the big screen. You know, Preston Thompson is going to be writing the screenplay. Um, the book is about a young couple in love who moved to a secluded property in the countryside of England. Once there, a series of strange events unfolds that turns their new romance into a harrowing nightmare that they must find their way out of. Oh, bum. So this will be its second adaptation to the screen, though the first one was 50 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> 1972 that one dropped people so uh yeah andrew rona and alex heineman are gonna be producing uh so uh yeah people if you're fans of agatha christie that is uh something to look forward to so um that, listen when i first heard about this film i was a bit like eh what? But then you actually find out what it's about, and you're like, oh, shit. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, Kathy Bates stars in it. You know, we talked about Kathy this episode, right? Um, Along with John Malkovich, Lewis Pullman, right? It's been directed by Ken Quapia. Um, Quapis. Uh, it's written by Andrew Farout. Right, and it's called Felma. So it's about Felma Tall, right? Who is the mother of John Kennedy Tall, 
um, who wrote a confederacy of dunces, which happened to win a Pulitzer Prize, right? Which you're like, huh, okay, which is crazy. It's a crazy thing because essentially, um, the young tool, right? He committed suicide in 1969. 1969, the book hadn't even been published, hadn't been published, right, he couldn't find a home for it, and so his mum, Thelma, made it her life's mission to see the book come to the masses, which, man, that, that's a heartwarming fucking story, right, so with the help of some outrageous Actions. She succeeds in getting the manuscript into the hands of writer Walt, Walker Percy, who's being played by John Malkovich, who then went on to champion it. The book was published in 1980 and became a widely celebrated cult classic. Stephen P. Wegner and John Lynn produce. But that is, you know, so 11 years after he died, she got it done, which is incredible. Incredible, people. But let us end on this. Because um, Anthony Mackie is making a film, right? And, you know, yes, obviously, he's made a lot of films. But this one, he is directing, right? It is called Spark. And it is about, I think, Maybe an, a, a civil rights campaigner, pioneer, who most people don't know about, right? Claudette Colvin. Now, I knew about her, but he, he was... I didn't find out about it straight away, right? This was something I was looking into something and I stumbled on this, right? Because essentially, the, the story about Colvin was... She was the first to not give up her seat on a bus, right? She, uh, you know what I mean, took a stand and, yeah, kept seating, man, in, in Alabama, which is, you know what I mean, come on, right? But, you know, she's a 15-year-old and, you know, she, she's dark-skinned. And the civil rights movement, they were just a bit like, you know what? I think we're going to get more from Rosa Parks. But it happened nine months before the Rosa Parks incident. And that's not to diminish what Parks did. Because that was extremely brave as well. You know what I mean? But I don't think you should, you know what I mean, relegate Colvin to the shadows. Because that's insane. You know what I mean? Uh... So, yeah, they're making a film about it, which, yeah, that's incredible. It, it, it took this long, but I am so glad it's happening, right? So, um, Mackie will also produce, along with Kelburn Akeem, Jason Michael Berman, and Mark Ambrose. Uh, Nicole R. Levy is writing it, um, and it's actually based on a book by Philip Hoos, called Claudette Colvin, Twice Towards Justice. So, people, there you go. There you go. All right, so, boom, Echo Chamber done. Go check out those films. Home, people, because it was great. The other ones are already out. Enjoy. Yeah, watch it. Watch the videos on, on YouTube if you are just listening to the audio, and we will see you next week. All right? Peace.